So one thing that we do at Elliot is we set up our preaching schedule based on themes. These themes are selected um, in consultation with me, but also uh, involve a number of other people, people from our parish committee, which is like a church board, and people from our worship committee, and of course the deacons who are part of that. And so, you know, this, this gives us a chance to make sure that the topics sort of change over time and we're not listening to the same thing just because I'm interested in something. And, you know, it can create some interesting variety, I think. So recently we did a series on art, creativity, and the sacred. And this sermon comes from that, I should note, uh, the week before I got my hair cut. So, you know, that sort of dates the video a little bit. Um, and what I'm talking about in it are words and the power of words and how we interpret words today in a postmodern society. The text was the first psalm. We did a number of different translations and interpretations of the first psalm uh, during the service, before the sermon, to sort of get a sense of how one can look at a text and think it says one thing and then think about it a little bit more um, and, you know, uh, see that there's some nuance and some depth there. Um, sort of the preaching, well, I'm not sure it's the preaching text, the guiding text, which we did not use as a reading during the service, was that first verse from the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And uh, that's sort of, you know, um, sort of where we start as sort of, you know, as getting a sense of sort of the foundation of this topic. So here you go. Uh, the first sermon from our series on art, creativity, and the sacred. So I chose this topic some time ago, back in the fall, actually. Um, the committee, worship committee brainstormed theme ideas, if you wondered how our themes came to be this year. And at the time, it seemed to make sense that if we were to do a series on art, creativity, and the sacred, we should start with words. With words, with the basic building blocks of how we describe our world. After all, the beginning of the Gospel of John, a passage we most often hear at Christmas Eve, starts with an observation a paraphrase or description of the beginning of Genesis. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. I know I didn't read it today, but it should sound familiar to you. You mostly show up at Christmas Eve. In the beginning was the Word, and all things from that beginning, according to the Bible, were spoken or articulated into existence. Words are the foundation of storytelling, of poetry and preaching. They are the primary means of description, even in our modern world. They are the primary means of description when we need to set a scene or explore a feeling. So it made sense to cover it in this series, but I think I may have made a mistake thinking that I could do it in 15 minutes. Because what is also true is that sometimes words fail. And when we use them, there is always a barrier to understanding, great or small, between what we mean and what is heard or read. Which is to say that my words today, when I stand up here in the pulpit, mean one thing to me, and quite possibly something else to you. Today I open with that observation from the preacher and professor Paul Scott Wilson, that while many words remain the same, their meanings have changed. Unity was once good, he says, now it can be oppressive. History was once valid, now it is questioned. Knowledge was once obvious, and now it is challenged. Truth was once certain, 
and now it is relative. That is a product of the very specific time we live in. Postmodern subjectivity has made us think twice about the objective meaning of what we say. In fact, a year ago Sunday, we were thinking about what we say, and it caused us to review the words we use in the prayer of Jesus, that is, the Lord's Prayer. However, this dynamic, the subjectivity of meanings in words and symbols, has been going on our whole lives. And really, for as long as people have been talking, so we have grown used to it, even when it is at the root of disagreements. So here's an example. Early in my ministry, before I came here to Elliott Church, I was confronted by a fundamentalist minister in public at a nursing home event built around poetry and, as it turns out, the songs. Now, without getting into the details, which I can tell you at coffee hour, it's quite a story. That pastor cited the first song, two versions of which we heard today, and made it clear that he and his congregation were representatives of the righteous, and I and my congregation were among the ungodly. The ungodly. Who in the King James Version of the Bible are like the chaff which the wind driveth away, and whose way again from the King James, would perish. Now, not surprisingly, I had not thought of us as ungodly. Nor, honestly, did I think of he and, and his church as ungodly. For me, and my postmodern universalist context, my universalist congregation, where people try hard to be good and frequently mess up in large and small ways while remaining love. For us, the same psalm hit differently. When we read the psalm in church, we saw or believed that the opposite of those who walk hand in hand with goodness, to use Nan Merrill's words to describe righteousness, that the opposite of righteousness is not the wicked or the ungodly, but the unloving. Not the wicked or the ungodly, but the unloving, who, for whatever reason, cannot reach out in their own pain and anger to see the goodness, sometimes hidden goodness, were we to be honest, in others and themselves. They will be isolated from wisdom, again, from Nan Merrill's interpretation. For love knows the way of truth. Love knows the way of truth. You see, in the liberal church, theology is poetry, built on metaphor and riding the wave of an ongoing creation, a constant revelation. So the idea that the King James Bible, put together by a committee of academics 420 years ago, could translate a somewhat disputed text already thousands of years old with a specificity so precise that our neighbors in the year 2001 could rest assured that they stood on the right side of history and we were on the wrong side of history, that idea seemed a bit far-fetched. And that odd, I would say old-school confrontation, it appeared that both sides read the Bible, but that we did so in very different ways. And therefore, we arrived at very different conclusions. Now, the reason for that difference had to do with the flexible meaning of words. That difference had to do with the flexible meaning of words. It had to do with that part of ourselves we brought to the text, and what we thought the text contained. Our interpretation, and I would say their interpretation, 
the subjective. As the poet Mary Oliver observed in our reading, poetry is a river. Many voices travel it. Poem after poem moves along the exciting crests and falls of the river waves. None is timeless, she tells us. Each arrives in historical context. Almost everything in the end passes. So each of us has a different interpretation. Each of us comes from a different content. Each reflects a different world and a different truth. When we read a poem, or a song, which is just a type of poem, we bring our own experience and our own bias to it. Vasily Kandinsky, the great painter, some of you remember, whose words we struggled through two weeks ago, tells us that when we encounter any work of art, we are encountering, among other things, the original intent of its creator, the experience and intent of translators and interpreters, and the context of today. And then finally, we interpret it through our own lens of experience, our own biases and beliefs. And all these streams, the ones that are brought to us and the ones that we bring, come together to create an active conversation through the work itself. I think, like Bill repeating Mary Oliver, I'm going to repeat that again. All those streams, the ones that are brought to us and the ones that we bring, come together to create an active conversation through the work itself. That is why some types of art appeal to us more than others, for the same reason that some sports appeal more than others. Herb's a baseball guy. I will always love the Celtics more. And with that part of the world, we are in dialogue with the world. And we are also in dialogue with that part of the world that has been framed and highlighted by our or someone else's creativity. And that part of the world that has been framed and highlighted by our or someone else's creativity is art. Now this dialogue that we have, this conversation, is a religious act that requires work and attention. Otherwise, we are like that fundamentalist pastor, comfortably imposing one static interpretation on something as dynamic as the space between words, thereby ending conversation with an assertion of certainty. This open dialogue is part of the sacredness of art and the sacredness of worship, which is, as I have said repeatedly, also an art. Sermons use words, and so do prayers. And when we come together to listen and to speak, we do not, or should not, expect perfect understanding. But what we hope is that together we can bring about a little bit of the divine presence on earth. <clears throat> Art brings about a little bit of the divine presence on earth. Now, of course, this act of creation also creates risk. The risk of being misunderstood, or being understood more than we wish to be understood. It creates the risk of change, too. Those deep changes that Wilson talks about when he says we must die to the old way of viewing things to live for the new. After all, when someone tells us we are ungodly, they are setting us up as something to fear while hiding behind the edifice of an idea that has outlived its time. However, what the Psalms tell us, what poetry tells us, what the poetry of theology tells us, 
with the divine word that flows through the earth into our ears and out of our mouths tells us is that creation continues through our work and our works and through the work of those who come after. Mary Oliver says in our reading that it doesn't matter if risk is close by. So let us take a moment in silence now to consider the creative act of conversation and what words we use as we continually redefine the sacred and the mundane, life and death itself. 